سَمِعْتُ صَوْمَ غَدٍ عَنْ أَدَائِي فَرْضِ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ هَذِهِ السَّنَةِ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا لوجه الله الكريم عز وجل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أبي الله برادرز السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله نايت نمبر 25 and besides for the 27th night, which is many reports of it being the, you know, the most prom uh, probable night of Laylatul Qadr, number 25 is perhaps second most. So inshallah, every moment this evening, you know, if you, dec you know that your decrees are being put out, that your uh, risk for the next year, your life, your death, your family, everything is de determined this evening. Inshallah, make the most of it. May Allah grant us the strength. I mean, we continue with our series, The Mercy to the Worlds, the biography of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We mentioned that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had just captured had just captured Khaybar. And it so, in, it so happened that as the Nabi Sallam had signed the treaty with the people of Khaybar, the Muslims who were in Abyssinia had returned. So they have been now in Abyssinia almost 15 years. Remember they made the first hijrah. Ja'far has now come back. Why? Because now there's peace with the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah and the capturing of Khaybar. All the enemies in the immediate area have been subdued. And so the Nabi Sallam said, I don't know what makes me happier to see the to to conquer Khaybar or that I'm seeing Ja'far again after all this time and the Muslims now Ja'far and the Nabi Sallam they grew up together in the house of Abu Talib Ja'far is the brother of Sayyidina Ali but much older and so they would have grown up together they were more like brothers and so the Nabi Sallam uh, uh, welcomed them and gave the people of the people of uh, Abyssinia uh, all of them a share of of Khaybar uh, the Sahaba said up until Khaybar this was the first time since the Hijrah has been like seven eight years that we could eat our full now Alhamdulillah the situation was better the Muajireen returned what the uh, Ansar had given them and we have this little bit of uh, not competition between the people of Abyssinia and the Muaj and the other Muslims so Sayyidina Umar said to the wife of Ja'far Asma ibn Umais Asma binti Umais remember her name Asma binti Umais Sayyidina Umar said to her jokingly you had it very easy you guys living in Abyssinia whereas we were here fighting the battles defending the Nabi Sallam and uh, you know we have a, a notch above you and she didn't like this and she said I'm going to tell the Nabi Sallam what you said because we were over there you didn't ha we didn't have the Nabi Sallam to make dua for us to comfort us when we were weak we were alone isolated you had him with you and so the Nabi Sallam made that beautiful statement. He said that the people of the Muslims that came from Abyssinia, they made two hijras, whereas the rest of you made one. And there is no competition between all of you are equal. All, all of you are equal. The Nabi Sallam now starts uh, um, writing letters to the kings of the world. And the da'wah is now showing it is global. It's not just an Arabian thing. It's not just an Arab thing. And he wrote a letter to Najashi, the negus of Abyssinia. And this is where he embraced Islam. And we know that soon after he embraced Islam, he, didn't, uh, he, he passed away. And he's the only person that the Nabi Sallam made janazah salah uh, in abstention. The Nabi said, Najashi has passed away. Your brother and no one made janazah on him, obviously, in, in Abyssinia. And so the Muslims made janazah salah on, on, on him. And the Nabi Sallam wrote a letter to the ruler of Bahrain. And he embraced Islam and beauty. And then as a, as a gift, he had sent the Nabi Sallam a beautiful cloak, a, a red cloak. Now it's something, when the Sahaba saw it and he put it on, they said it was the full moon. And we looked at the moon and we looked at him and he was, he outshone the moon. That's how beautiful he was. The Nabi Sallam was beautiful, but he never wore fancy clothing. Now he's got this amazing, amazing uh, cloak on. And the Sahaba are like making tawaf around his cloak and they are saying, we've never touched something so amazing. Now the Nabi Sallam was surprised at them. He said, are you guys impressed with this thing? Wallahi, the tissue, the toilet paper of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, remember Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, is better than this. Now Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad had died, you know, Ahzab. He said, it's even better than this. Is That what you're going to get in Jannah, the toilet paper basically of Jannah is better than this, subhanAllah. The Nabi Sallam also wrote a letter to the Mukawqas, the uh, ruler of the, the Coptic uh, patriarch of Egypt. He was a Christian, he was the ruler. And he took the letter and he honored the letter and he sent the Nabi and he responded in a very polite way. And he sent many gifts to the Nabi Sallallahu which the Nabi distributed. And he sent two sisters who were slaves. At that time, the Christians, what they would do is uh, people of high society, they would donate their children to the church. 
So these two sisters came from very high families. They were donated as to the church, and he had gifted both of them to the Nabi Sallam. The Nabi Sallam had asked uh, the one sister, Sirin, who would you like to marry of the Sahaba? And she chose a Sahabi. As for the other one, Maria, she chose to stay with the Nabi Sallam. And this is that famous Maria who would give birth to the Nabi Sallam's only other son other than with Khadija. The Nabi Sallam would marry this lady Maria, al qittiya our mother, and she would give birth to Ibrahim. So after all these years, Allah would bless the Nabi Sallam just before in his, in his 60s, almost 60, with a son. And the Sahaba said how much he loved this little boy. He would go and visit him and play with him. And then, of course, as Allah had decreed, Allah said, Muhammad is not the father of any of the boys. As Allah said in Surah Azab, this son was destined to pass away in his infancy. And we know that hadith where the Nabi Sallam was crying. And the Sahaba said, you, even you, Ya Rasulullah, you cry. They said, yes, the eyes are sad. And the, the, the eyes cry and the heart is sad, but the tongue only says, which pleases Allah. And Ya Ibrahim, we will meet you one, if it wasn't for the Qadr of Allah, we know we're going to meet you again in the, in the Akhirah. And as it happened, the eclipse, we know the story. As Ibrahim, the son of Muhammad, وسلم, passed away, there was a solar eclipse. And the Sahaba said, surely these two things are connected. And if the Nabi was a fraud, why, well, Ya you would have played with it. He said, no. Nothing, the heavens and the earth, the sun and the moon have their own orbits. It has nothing to do on the earth, cannot impact that. And so uh, um, the Nabi Sallallahu um, uh, again, every single child of his, Ruqayya had also passed away at this point. Zainab also had passed away. The only child that didn't pass away in his lifetime was Fatima. So imagine the Nabi Sallallahu buried eight of his children, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the time had come for the Umrah al qada Remember the Quraysh had an agreement, you can't make Umrah this year, but you can come back next year. And so... 2,000 Muslims sign up to go perform the Umrah with the Nabi Sallam. This was in uh, al Qaeda, the month before Hajj. Muslim, men and women, and they all, subhanAllah, uh, and this is where all the rituals of Hajj, they went to Tana'im, or rather Dhul Hulayfa, or called Bi'ar Ali, where they put the ihram on, as you would do from Medina. So when we, when, that's why we make Umrah from Medina. You can make from anywhere, from Jeddah, wherever. But the Nabi Sallam, of course, he came from Medina. And um, he was now, and the Sahaba were making the Talbiyah, and it must have been such a sight. And when the Nabi Sallallahu arrived just outside of Mecca, they were given three days. The Quraysh said, you only have three days and then you need to leave. And that is per the treaty. And news reached the Muslims. Now, many of the Muslims haven't been back to Mecca, inside Mecca, since Hijrah. Six, it's been seven, eight, eight years, so eight years, subhanAllah. And so there were news that we're going to see them and they're going to be, Medina was known for its diseases. Remember when they just came there, there were diseases. So they said, the Muslims are going to be weak. You're going to see how they are. When this reached the Nabi Sallallahu he said, guys, Unshe you know, not unsheath, like expose your right arm. And that's why we do that. We open the right arm to show the guns, show that we are strong. And when we make the first round of tawaf, we rummel, we jog. And when we make the sai, we jog that piece. And so this image for the Quraysh, the Quraysh had sort of exited Makkah and stayed on the hills. They didn't want to be in Makkah, when the Muslims, but they're watching. And they see this 2,000 people. And they're making the talbiyah loud. This is the first time the true talbiyah of Nabi Ibrahim is made. That's why we make the talbiyah loud. Usually, when you make dhikr, it's softly. But the Nabi said, make the Talbi aloud so they can hear, La sharik alak, la bayka Allahumma la bayk, la bayka la sharik. There is no sharik for you, Ya Allah. Now, that time, the haram, of course, was still shared with non-Muslims. And their Umrah, how did they make? Naked. They would make Umrah naked. They were worshipping their idols. And people could see Islam versus paganism. And this touched the heart of many of the people of Mecca and said, look at these people, look how beautiful their, hajj, their, their Umrah was. And so the Nabi Sallam, of course, they slaughtered the animals and distributed it. And... Um, and this had a huge impact on uh, many of the people of Mecca seeing Islam uh, uh, in, its, in, its, uh, you know, in its totality. Three days, the Nabi Sallam asked the Quraysh, extend, allow us an extension. The Quraysh said, no, no extension. And so after three days, the Muslims are about to evacuate or vacate Mecca. As they are leaving Mecca, a girl comes and says, Ya, ya Nabi Sallam, uh, take me with you. Who is this girl? She says, I'm Umara, the daughter of Hamza. So Hamza had a daughter who was in Mecca. Um, and this daughter grew up there and he obviously had said Hamza and she said my mother had died I am an orphan I want to go with you I'm a Muslim and so now the Sahaba are arguing amongst each other who should get her the first one to stand up is Zaid ibn Haritha Zaid the son of Nabi Sallam the adopted son he said me and Hamza were like we were brothers we looked after each other so this is like my, my daughter then Sayyidina Ali said with all due respect Zaid Hamza and I are actually relatives we are family members so Fatima take her that she will be our our, 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 our orphan. And then Ja'far, Ja'far who also had come back now from Abyssinia, he said, I should take her because I am like Ali. Ali and I are brothers, which means we are equal to Hamza. Plus, my wife is this girl's auntie. This girl, her mother and my wife are sisters. And so the Nabi said that he first 
praised all of them and he said, Zayd, you and you and I are one, Ali, you and I are one, Ja'far, you resemble the you resemble the me, you resemble me the most in akhlaq and character. I love all of you. But the mother, the auntie of the the sister of the mother is like the mother. Your mommy's sister is like your mommy. And so he gave this girl. Now, this is the point of this is where were they before Islam? What did they do to their own daughters? Buried them alive. Now Islam, 10 years, 20 years of Islam, and they are arguing who should get this girl. If it wasn't for Islam, this girl would have been, she wouldn't have been alive, subhanAllah. It shows you the psychology, how Islam is taking root in the hearts of, of the people. Amongst the events after this Umrah, before the Nabi Sallam had left, three of the most prominent young Quraysh, the rising stars of Quraysh now embrace Islam. Amr bin al-As, the great politician, Khalid bin Walid, the general of the Quraysh, and Uthman ibn Talha, the keeper of the keys of the Kaaba. So now the top of the cream of the crop of Quraysh are seeing that, look, this is a done deal, that this is the winning side. We are on the wrong side. And so they embrace Islam. And then just before the Nabi was about to leave, Al-Abbas, his uncle, says to the Nabi Sallam, my sister-in-law, Maymuna, she lost her husband. I'm, off, she, I'm her wali now. I'm asking you to marry her. And the Nabi Sallam agrees to marry Maymuna. This is going to be the last wife of the Nabi Sallam. And he uses the opportunity. He says, Ya Quraysh, we are family. Let us make a hafla. Let's make a walima. I stay in Mecca and we have a nikah and you come and we eat. Let's put all our, let bygones, we got bygones. We have a, wed a, 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 a wedding. You know Maymuna, you know me. Let us be family again. Quraysh said, Abu Sufyan said, we are not in need of your walima. Nonetheless, the Nabi Sallam married our, our mother Maymuna and uh, um, she says that out, they had to get married outside of Mecca because the Quraysh would not allow them to have the nikah in Mecca. And uh, Maymuna, our mother, radiallahu anha, she says this place called Sarf, Sarf, Sarif, outside of Mecca, is the most, beauty, the most beloved place on earth to me. And it so happened that when she died, she wanted to be buried in that spot where she, where she had um, married the Nabi Sallam. Now we just quickly go on a tangent with the wives. At this point, the Nabi Sallam has how many wives now? SubhanAllah. He has Aisha, so Soda first, Soda, Aisha, Hafsa, Umm Salama, Zainab bint Jahsh. We did Zainab bint Khuzaimah, she passed away. Juwairiya, Safiya, Umm Habiba, Maymuna, Maria. Right? Ten. Ten of the wives of the Nabi Salam. Right? So these are. Ten wives and subhanAllah, right? And each one we've listened, we learned their stories. And these, subhanAllah, Allah says in the Quran, these are your mothers. You need to know their biographies. You need to know their names. You don't know your own mommy's name. And so, obviously, the Nabi's household is, is very big now. And everyone's lifestyle is increasing. All the people in Medina, their lifestyle is increasing as the Muslim Ummah is becoming stronger. But the Nabi's is not increasing his. And so the wives as a group, as a, as a delegation, they complain and complain to the Nabi Sallam that we want our, us also, we also want to have an upgrade in our salary, upgrade now. And the Nabi Sallam becomes upset with them and he boycotts them, he leaves them. And Sayyidina Umar gives us one of this very long hadith, it's in the slides, it's a beautiful hadith, one of the longest hadiths uh, uh, that you have is the hadith of Sayyidina Umar who tells us the story. Sayyidina Umar says, um, you know, that he and his neighbor, Ansari, they would take turns. You go to the masjid, you learn from the Nabi Sallam, and then you teach me while I work in the field, and then it's my turn tomorrow, and we swap, we alternate. So it was my turn to be in the field. And I was working, and then my neighbor came running. You could see he, had, he was panicked. And Sayyidina Umar said, are we being attacked? That's how panic-stricken the man was. So I said, no, it's even worse than that. The Nabi Sallam has divorced all his wives. The Nabi Sallam divorced all ten of his wives. So Sayyidina Umar was shocked. He couldn't believe this. And he says, now in the hadith, it's beautiful. He talks to himself. He said, I knew it. Hafsa, it was just a matter of time. Hafsa his daughter. I told her, I knew that it's just a matter of time. She's going to step out of line. He goes to, to uh, he first goes to the house of, of, of the Nabi Sallam, which is Aisha's house. And he hears Aisha crying. And he says to her through the curtain, what did you do? What did you do? So he said, don't ask me. Ask your daughter what she did. Right? So, the Nabi, so Sayyidina Umar goes to Hafsa. Hafsa is crying. He says, I told you, I told you, why can't you behave yourself? What did you do to, to upset him? And so Hafsa said, um, I don't know if he divorced me or not. I don't know. He's, 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 he's left us. He said, I'm not going to be with any of you. And he's staying in an apartment up, up uh, in the masjid, a little attic, and he's, he's staying there. He's not visiting any of his wives. And the Nabi Sallam, uh, Sayyidina Umar wants to go and see the Nabi Sallam. But there's a guard at the door, and he said, he's not taking any visitors. Nabi Sallam does not want to see anybody. He's, he's very upset. And so Sayyidina Umar shouts loudly he says oh rasulullah it is umar at the door and if he thinks that i'm here to side with hafsa then that's not the case i'm here to side with him against hafsa whatever she did i'm on your side and so the nabi sallam allowed sayyidina umar in and this is the hadith part of the hadith which you all know when he entered the room and the nabi was lying on a uh, a, a mat of date uh, leaves 
and that sort of cut into his sides. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, you are the most beloved to Allah and you are lying on this that is cutting into your skin whereas the emperor of Rome and the emperor of Persia are living like in palaces. So the Nabi said that this is their Jannah whereas this is our, our place of trials. Now he can, Sayyidina Umar can see that the Prophet is, is upset. This is a household. And subhanAllah, the Quraysh couldn't put him in this mood. His wives, his wives can make him so depressed. And so he wants to lighten the mood and he says, Ya Rasulullah, remember the good old days when we came, when we were in Mecca, when we were in control of our women. We would talk to them and they would listen. Then we came to Medina and we found the ladies of Medina in control of their men. So our ladies learned from their ladies how to treat us. Now when I speak to my wife, she backchats me. And when I say, how can you backchat me? She says, who are you? Your daughter backchats the Nabi Sallam. And I basically can't say that. So the Nabi smiled to say, you're also getting it at home. Umar is also getting it at home. And then the, then, yeah, uh, uh, the Nabi then he asked, say, no, then, the, then Sayyidina Umar asked the Nabi Sallam, have you divorced them, Ya Rasulullah? So he said, no, I have not divorced them. But I have made a vow. I'm not going to see them for one month. I'm going to give them a time to think about what they, are, what they want, what they want to do. And so this is where Aisha now comes in. She says, at, she was counting the days. Every day is counting, counting. And as a, you know, all of a sudden, on the 29th day, after 20, he came. And she said, oh, I, I thought you were going to stay away for a month, are you, a day early. So he says, Aisha, don't you know? Some days are, some months are 29, some days are 30. And then the Nabi Sallallahu says to her, Allah, Allah has revealed ayat. And this is in the Quran where Allah says, tell your wives that if they wish the enjoyment of the dunya, we will give you a good going. We will let you go. We'll divorce you in a nice way. Oh, wives of the Nabi Sallam, you may go and live your life and be with whomever you want. Being with the Nabi Sallam requires you have to share a husband. It's so strict. All this hijab. If you don't want all these things, there's no problem. All of you may leave. Now make a choice. And so he said, oh, Aisha, I'm asking you first. I'm going to go to all of them. What is it that you want? But before you answer, consider your options. Speak to Abu Bakr. So he said, what is there for me to consider? I want to be with you. And I choose to be your wife and go through this, it is better for me. Then she said, are you going to ask the other wives as well? So he said, yes. Don't tell them I said yes. She knows if I said yes, then they're going to want to say yes. So he said, I can't do that. I can't, I'm not being sent to deceive anyone. So he asked all of them, subhanAllah, look, is this what you want? You know what you're getting yourself into. I can't be, and I have the, world, the, the weight of the world on my shoulders. And so all of them agreed that they want to stay with him. And then Allah revealed ayat. Ya Nabi, la yahillu laka nisa'in ba'du. Ya own Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa it is not lawful for you now to marry any other woman besides these women. And you cannot divorce them either. So divorce became haram for the Nabi sallallahu as well. He could not marry anyone else. He couldn't divorce them. He couldn't change them. And so these became the women that Allah had chosen for him in this dunya and in, and in the akhirah. This is with regards to the wives of the Nabi sallallahu And that's the chapter we closed. We continue again quickly. The Nabi sallallahu also wrote letters to, as we said, the rulers of the world. And some of the most interesting letters were the letters he wrote to the two most powerful men on earth. The Khusru, the emperor of Persia, and Heracles, the emperor of Rome. Now, these are the two biggest guys on earth. And um, the, we, let's jump quickly to the letter of Khusru, who was actually the emperor of Persia, was really the greatest man on earth, the most powerful man on earth. And so the Nabi Sallam wrote him a letter saying uh, from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, the slave and the messenger of Allah, to Khusru, the emperor of Persia, Aslim to Slim, embrace Islam and be saved. But if you reject this message, then you will have the sin of your people upon you. And uh, so it's a very straightforward message. And when Khusru got this letter, the emperor of Persia said, who is this man who dares write me a letter like this? And he tore the letter up and he basically insulted the uh, messenger, the, the guy, the Sahabi coming to bring the letter. And he tore up the letter and he threw it uh, uh, away. And then he sent a message to one of his governors in Yemen. Go and fetch this Muhammad to me. Bring him here. I want to see him myself. Right? So the governor of Yemen sent two spies to go and capture the Nabi Sallam. When they arrive in Medina, and these guys were scared, they realized, look, this is not uh, going to be a simple thing. And the Nabi, he, they said, here's a letter from Khusru uh, responding to your letter. The Nabi didn't even look at the letter. He said, your ruler, your emperor, as he had torn my letter up, Allah is going to tear his kingdom up. And go to your Rabb. Now, look, these are the spies of Badan, the governor. Right? So we have Khusru, the, the, the ruler. We have Badan, who is the governor. And we have the two spies. So the Nabi says to the spies, go back to your Rabb, who is Badan, your Lord, and tell Badan, your Lord, that my Lord Allah has killed his Lord, which is Khusru. So what is this? So they went back to Yemen, and as they get there, the governor of Yemen tells them that Khusru has just been cooed by his own son, and he was tortured to death by his own son. 
and this begins the complete dissolution of the Persian Empire. For 1,000 years, this empire ruled, and within five years, the entire history, legacy, religion, the entire Persian Empire would dissolve completely. As the Prophet said, as he tore up my letter, this, your kingdom would disappear. And with Khusru was the end of the Persian Empire. We'll get to how that, uh, uh, how that ends. We'll also talk about the letter that was sent to Heracles, the emperor of Rome tomorrow, inshallah, bi-ibnillah. Uh, we just, uh, quick, quick, um, could do our quiz. So yesterday's quiz. Hashim uh, Ariftim? Okay, mashallah. All right, you'll get the prize, alhamdulillah. And then just a reminder of fitra and fidya, please. Your fitra and fidya before the end of the month. Jazakallah khair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.